chronic pain, such a serious issue that we have around the world, but particularly in the United States, the updated number that I have for you is 116 million of 238 million adults in the United States have chronic pain. That's one of two. So we're going to talk about more solutions here. And as the show goes along, I want to talk about the, some of the physiology of the body, how, the, how that physiology builds into chronic pain. But then we can have non-drug, non-opiate solutions of tearing down that pain in some people, maybe many people, if we implement some of the strategies I'm going to talk about here. The opioid epidemic is a serious deal, but not just opioids. How about just over-the-counter medications like things that we all take for granted, ibuprofen, acetaminophen, Aleve, and so forth. We're going to talk about those and how those are a poor decision on dealing with chronic pain. Behind the scenes, as no surprise to all of you, it gets really ugly because the money is so big. I would encourage you, here we are at the end of 2017, go to the radio show Reveal, Reveal. On October 21st of 17, they have a really interesting show that they did uh, based with the Center for Investigative Reporting, talking about what happened behind the scenes. And they linked to a story, a Washington Post article titled, just follow the title and you'll understand what I'm getting at here, The Drug Industry's Triumph Over the DEA. The Drug Industry's Triumph over the DEA, October 15th of 2017 was that article. You put that into Sir Google and it will pop right up. What they're talking about is how behind the scenes, the big drug boys were able to influence the DEA in a way that some people, uh, the authors were Scott Hingham and Lenny Bernstein, and they were talking about how some people at the DEA were doing a good job at coming to some sources of uh, inappropriate, I don't know if the word is illegal, but inappropriate distribution of opiates. When these people in the DEA were kind of sounding the alarms, they got squished and kind of booted out, if you will. I'm just uh, using my own words here, but if you read those articles, it's really interesting and really, really ugly. Now, for a moment, what I want to do is talk about these people that have chronic pain are looking for solutions, right? So they turn to these medications. If we just stop the flow of medications, let's say today we all get together and we shut off all opiates. Well, what are these people going to do? That's going to be the, the remainder of the show. We need to talk about chronic pain, what causes it, but giving people non-opiate, non-drug solutions. That's what I want to be talking about for the, for the rest of the show here. I'm going to talk about the adaptations of the nervous system how the nervous system and the soft tissues in your body unfortunately morph and change into becoming producers of chronic pain. And then with the strategies we're going to implement here today, and you, could, you can do on your own, that you can undo neurologically and soft tissue-wise and structurally and inflammatory-wise, how you can change your body over time so it comes from a chronic pain situation to something different. The first thing is we talked about in prior shows is mindset. You have to be prepared, and, and I know anybody watching this show right now, if you don't have chronic pain, you know somebody that does, because it's one out of two people. You have to have a mindset that says, I must do this, I cannot rely on drugs. Drugs are a poor way of finding the solutions. We're gonna talk about chiropractic and how effective chiropractic is. Chiropractic went head to head with the best drugs out there on dealing with chronic pain and we are better than five times more effective than some of the drugs out there that are commonly used. You, we're going to talk about nutrition, how it's related to chronic pain. This will surprise a lot of you. Of course we need more hydration. I would say 80% of the people coming into my office are chronically dehydrated. That's really bad for inflammatory processes. We're going to talk about exercise as well. I have a low-level laser, uh, low le uh, a therapeutic laser in my office. Laser has been shown to outperform other things to deal with inflammation. We're going to talk about effective supplements. We're going to be focusing on the omega-3 good fats as battling the too much of the omega-6 fats that are inflammatory and how that can play a role. 
Sleep, of course, and reducing stress. Most of us know that these are the situations that we need to do. Just a little bit more about opiates and how serious it is. Just looking today, 91 people a day are dying in this country because of overdoses of opioids, but that also includes heroin, which is related to that, as you know. That show reveal that I want you to look at in the Washington Post, there are the dates of those shows. Take a look at that sometime. It's really alarming how behind the scenes these drug companies, of course, if we all had a drug company, what would we want? Our goal as a drug company is to sell as many drugs as possible and get as many people on long-term medications as we can because that's the only product that we have. If that's the only product that we have, that's our goal. So maybe we'll do things behind the scenes to promote that and that's, that's really ugly stuff. So we need to find some other things. Now some of the more accepted treatments is non-steroidal anti-inflammatory medications, non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs. Those are the ibuprofens, the Aleve, the Celebrex, the prescription and non-prescription things. We've known since 1999 that 16,500 people a year die because they took too many non-steroidal anti-inflammatory medications. 16,500 people a year. I say that number, nobody really thinks about it because it's not them, they don't think it's going to be them. But now let's put it in a little more perspective. That means 18 years, in the past 18 years, that's approximately 300,000 people have died in the United States, just the US now, just the United States from taking too many ibuprofens, aspirins, Aleves, and so forth. That's a lot of people. Now those are just the people that died. The people that are injured that end up in a hospital because of liver damage, gastrointestinal bleeding, and so forth, that's 100,000 people a year that end up in the hospital because of the side effects of these medications. So that would be 1.8 million people hospitalized in the past 18 years because of just these medications that everybody kind of takes for granted. They're, they're okay to take. We know that these non steroidal anti-inflammatory medications can cause heart attacks, strokes, gastrointestinal bleeding, liver damage, kidney damage, miscarriages, it increases the rate of miscarriages, and ED in males. Now, catch this one, this is a, a new one here, it's probably new for you. In the journal Neurology in 2009, so nine years ago now, if you regularly use non-steroidal anti-inflammatory medications, you increase your personal risk of Alzheimer's dementia by 66%. Did you know that? Just using these medications that you can go into a store and buy right now, and if you have chronic pain, you can take those medications on a regular basis, you've increased your risk of Alzheimer's 66%. We have to find other solutions is the purpose here. In the plant paradox, the book called The Plant Paradox, they said it's even worse. When you're taking non steroidal anti-inflammatory medications, we already know it irritates the gastrointestinal lining because you get gastrointestinal bleeding. What you get is you get leaky gut. So now you get full food molecules passing across the, the gut membrane into the immune system, causing an autoimmune inflammatory reaction in your body, making you more susceptible to having chronic pain. Did you follow? The more you take these medications for chronic pain, the more chance you have of being a chronic pain sufferer because of the leaky gut caused by the medications. So it ends up being this, this vicious cycle. The more you take, the more you're gonna be dependent on them. So again, we need better solutions. Now some people will say, well, I don't take those medications, I take acetaminophen. Acetaminophen has its own problems and risks. The number of people that die from acetaminophen per year, it's somewhere around 500, so the numbers that die are much less. But the number one cause of acute liver failure that sends somebody to the emergency room is acetaminophen, particularly when it's mixed with alcohol. We have now several studies linking Tylenol and acetaminophen to autism. The rate of autism in the United States is 298 times higher than it is in Cuba. Now you've got two countries that are highly vaccinated populations, Cuba and the United States. The rate of autism in the United States is 200, not, not two, 298 times that in Cuba. 
and several studies have linked it to acetaminophen because we regularly give Tylenol and acetaminophen to children prophylactically when they get a shot, when they get a vaccine. They don't do that in Cuba. Do you follow? So there's its own problems by taking this on, on a regular basis. Well, let's talk a little bit about chronic pain, how it develops in your body, how it becomes a problem, and how we can start to tear this down. I'm going to be using these big terms, and you don't have to worry about that. Just, just follow along with me for a minute. We're going to talk how the nervous system becomes efficient at the pain pathway. One of the words that this is is neuroplasticity, meaning the nervous system is plastic. It's malleable. You can mold it. You unfortunately can make it efficient to have a pain pathway, but you can also, because it's moldable, you can tear down those pathways with the strategies I'm going to talk about by doing that. Synaptogenesis, a synapse. A synapse is when one nerve talks to another nerve and then talks to another one and so forth. When those nerves, those nerve pathways become more efficient, another word that's used in neurology is called synaptogenesis. You can create new ones, you can tear down old ones, you can then tear down new ones and create even further new ones, which we're going to talk about. And then this other, uh, other situation that works against us but then can work for us is something called wind up. You're taking a, a pain loop, if you will, and you're creating wind-up by turning this up uh, over time, you're actually creating, mechanically creating more nerve endings. That's what we're going to talk about here in my chart over here. So let's take a look at this. So what we're doing here in this chart is we're talking about a pain nerve ending. Okay? We've got a pain nerve ending, and in neurology it's called a nausea or noxious a noxious receptor, a nociceptor, okay? Now, chronic pain, the most common body area of chronic pain in the human is the lower back. The neck is close, the knee is there, the shoulder is there, and so forth. So, we're just going to talk about necks and, and backs right now for a while. We have pain nerve endings. Now, we have pain nerve endings everywhere. So, if I rub your skin, skin nicely, that feels good. But if I pinch it really hurt, hard, it hurts. So you've got, if you will, good nerve endings in your skin, and then you've got pain nerve endings in your skin. Well, in the joints and discs in your lower back, and the joints and discs in your neck, you've got good nerve endings, which make us feel good, and then you've got pain nerve endings if there's a problem. Okay? The pain nerve ending is called a nasi receptor or a nociceptor. It can be in the disc, which is the, the disc is the cartilage pads in between the bones of your spine, kind of like the cartilage in your knee. Okay, so a nociceptor can be in a disc, it can also be in a joint. A joint in the spine is called a facet. A facet joint is the joint in your spine that allows you to move. It can be in your neck or your back, and it works like a knuckle. Okay, so these pain nerve endings can be in discs and joints. Now let's say we get an injury. Let's say you get into a whiplash. Let's say you slip and fall. Let's say you lift up a heavy air conditioner, whatever it is, and you sprain your spine and you injure your spine. You're going to get disc pain and facet joint pain. More so in the lower back, the most chronic area for the most chronic source for, for pain is the disc. And in the, in the neck, it tends to be more of the joint or the facet. Okay? So then you have the pain nerve ending in there that shoots information into your spinal cord. The spinal cord is the thick cable inside the spine. That's the first messenger. So the pain message gets into the spinal cord and talks to the second nerve here in the spinal cord. And then this nerve goes up the spinal cord into a switchboard in the brain called the thalamus. The thalamus is a switchboard. It's deep inside your brain that receives the incoming electricity, incoming information. And then the thalamus says, okay, I need to now send it to... Uh, the, the map of your body to tell you where the pain is coming from, okay? So the thalamus sends it to the cortex or the big part of the brain and your brain here has a map of your body which tells you where the pain is. We know that's the case because if I take a little needle and I start sticking it in different areas of your body, you can tell me where that needle is even if your eyes are closed, right? Okay, 
So the brain will say it hurts and it hurts here or it hurts here. Follow? Very simple pathway right here. The problem is, is, so if you get a sprained ankle, let's say it's not serious, it completely and fully heals, pain is gone, no residual, you're good. If you have a pebble in your shoe and it hurts, you take the pebble out, no problem. This pathway is now gone. Okay? The problem arises is when we have chronic pain, hence our, our, our show here. Chronic pain can come from a couple of different ways. One way of doing it is to injure a disc bad enough where it's going to become a perpetual problem, okay? a sports injury, a whiplash. Or you could degenerate this disc over the course of a long period of time. The best example that I use in my office is a car tire. So there's two ways that you can injure a car tire, if you will. You can run over something and blow the tire, and there you go, and that's very easy to understand. Okay, you injured the tire, okay, the disc being the tire. Or you can misalign the front end of the car and then drive 20,000 miles, and along that way, there's really not many symptoms. You kind of don't know that there's a problem. It's brewing slowly over time, and then eventually when the wear and tear on that tire, the disc, gets uh, bad enough, you start to generate pain messages from here. It might build slowly uh, at first, but then over time the pain gets more and more significant. You can see that it's starting to build a, a chronic pain pathway. Earlier I used some of those words called neuroplasticity or synaptogenesis. The longer that this pathway is active, you actually begin to, begin to grow more sprouts from that same nerve ending. And you start to grow a more efficient pathway like this. Even though nothing else, nothing else has changed, it wasn't more nerve endings that are involved here, it's the same pathway becoming more efficient. It's almost like more side roads are feeding into the highway, feeding more traffic in here. This is called plasticity. So another example that would be practical for us would be piano playing. Let's say that you start to play the piano and you play for one hour on one day. How, long, how strong is this pathway? Not very strong. Let's say if you play the piano one hour a day for 20 years. How strong and efficient is that pathway going to be? Really strong and efficient. That's why sports people practice their craft frequently if not daily because they know the more they practice their craft the more their brain gets stronger in this pathway. The old saying of when you ride a bike you never forget. Okay? So let's say you ride your bike for 20 years and then you stop for 20 years and then you restart again. Are you going to remember how to ride that bike? Yeah, it's going to be pretty good compared to somebody that never rode their bike and then, the, and then they started, right? You follow? So the stronger the pathway, the more it's going to be there. So we can use this, this phenomenon of neuroplasticity or synaptogenesis in our favor or it can work against us in the case of chronic pain. What also happens, which is a bummer, is the initial insult here, the irritated disc, the injured facet, ligaments, tendons, muscles, and so forth, these can actually heal. Even though these are healed, because this pathway is so efficient, it can continue generating pain. That's a bummer, right? So that information will go up into the brain and continue to give you the sensation of pain. And that's why mild insults that someone can have, let's say, oh, barometric pressure, pressure changes, when the bad weather rolls in, right? Somebody will say, and I, as I like to say in my office, I have um, a, an office full of the best meteorologists on the planet. Because they'll say, yep, Dr. Fuller, my bum knees bugging me today. Within 12 to 24 hours, it's going to be raining, and I better pack my umbrella because they are always right. Just a dip in the atmospheric pressure, the barometric pressure, is enough to flare up this pain pathway because it's a chronic pain pathway. It is uh, efficient, and slight changes in the body can shoot that pathway there. You see? Okay. So now you've got this chronic pain pathway set up. Let me give you an ex another example. I like to talk about these three. So, by the way, I, I want to thank my colleague, Dr. Dan Murphy, uh, my good friend, my good mentor and, uh, and uh, colleague. He's helped me understand a lot of this over the past almost 30 years. 
he often talks about a patient of his, a Vietnam vet. And this Vietnam vet was shot in his hip, and unfortunately he lost his leg. So he lost his right leg. So unfortunately he had right leg pain. Now an astute observer would say that, well, there's no right leg, so it probably is not the leg. Okay? But he had right leg pain, and because this injury was so significant, all of the pain nerve endings in this area during that particular injury were recruited and shot this information up and created a very, very strong, very neuroplastically efficient pathway uh, from that initial intensive insult. Do you follow? Okay, so he had right leg pain. Now the brain here still thought he had a right leg. This is the phantom limb pain that you've thought about, right? So the the cortical, the brain map of the right leg on this side, the brain map of the right leg said, you still have a right leg, and by the way, it hurts. Um, and then he would say, well, you know, uh, I still have pain in my leg here because it's still being registered here from this super efficient pathway. For 10 years, he took drugs. He took pain relieving medications, really destroying his health to try to give him some relief on this pathway. He ends up in Dr. Murphy's office. And Dr. Murphy's using the principles uh, that I'm going to talk about in a minute of recruiting other nerve endings that can inhibit pain to shut down pain. Uh, he said, uh, okay, let's see what we can do about this. He starts working from a chiropractic perspective, now Dr. Murphy being a chiropractor. He starts working on, on this, uh, on this uh, Vietnam veteran as a chiropractor. Works on his lower back, sends signals of a special nerve ending, more on that in a minute, and works on him and says, I'll see you tomorrow. The man comes in the next day and Dr. Murphy says, how did you feel? He says, you know what, I had a little bit of relief of that right leg pain, but then it came right back and there it is again. No problem. He worked on him again, did a chiropractic adjustment again, came in the next day. How did it feel? You know what, a little bit more relief, lasted a little bit longer, but it's still there again. Okay, let's work on you again. And he did this many days a week for a year. After a year of his work, he was able to tear down this pathway and reestablish a new one, more on that in a moment, but able, was able to relieve the right leg pain in this Vietnam veteran. That man was so, was so moved by his results, he actually went to chiropractic college and became a chiropractor. So he is now a chiropractor. Pretty neat story. Okay? I like to talk about two of my patients in my office, Gail and John, both of them with chronic low back pain. John had low back pain for decades. Gail had low back pain for several years. They were in chronic pain. They were suffering. John had to give up his profession of being a rock and roll bass player and had to find other employment because he couldn't play anymore. Gail had to take early retirement because she didn't work, work anymore and she could only spend about two hours a day on her feet and then she had to lie down for the rest of the time. In both of their cases, I said, let's see what we can do, no promises, I'll do the best I can, let's work together. They said, both said, sure, don't know what else to do, don't want to be hooked on drugs my entire life, right? So I did exactly what Dr. Murphy did. In the case of Gail, I worked on it every day for a year, and then three times a week for year number two, and then once a week for year number three, and we're in year number five, and she still comes in once a week, but her back pain went from eight, nine, ten over ten to now one over 10, and now she's back walking three to four miles a day, loving her life, and I ask her every time she comes in, how's your back? I love my back. But that's the intensive care that it took. Now, how many people are gonna do that too? If you came into my office and you never had been to a chiropractor before, and you have chronic low back pain of 25, 30 years, right? And I say, I'm gonna see you every day for a year. How many of you are gonna do that? Probably not many of you. But what I do is I say this, let's work together for a month and see what happens. What do you think? I think that that's reasonable as a clinician. You might say that that's reasonable as the person that's suffering. Let's go for it. And what happens with a lot of these people is after a month, they are actually having a little bit of relief where nothing else gave them relief for the longest period of time. They said, let's go for this. Let's, let's work together. We go another month. They see a little bit more gain and so on and so on. You best believe insurance is not paying for that because by, by the time that first month is over, the insurance is run out and say, we're not paying for this anymore, even though it's working. Even though I could make an argument that if they were to take the medications, it would cost us hundreds of thousands of dollars more per person, if not millions, because of all the 
disability that they would have and all of these side effects from the medications from all the things that I had mentioned earlier would cost us all a lot more money never mind the devastation of that that person's life anyway so I could make the argument that you know we should go ahead and pay for that so what did we do what did the chiropractic do which is only one thing that I want to talk about here what the chiropractor did is it fired the nemesis nerve ending to the pain nerve ending. You've got a pain nerve ending, a NOSI receptor, and then you've got another special nerve ending that is the antithesis to it. It says, we're going to shut you down, we're going to block you, we're going to shut you off, we're going to tear up those roadways. This is called a mechanoreceptor. I've mentioned it only about five million times on this show in the past. Okay? It's a mechanical receptor, a mechanical detector, which is motion dependent. So right now, as an example, I've had pain in my back off and on for 30 years. And I know if I sit for a long period of time, if I sit for an hour, my back hurts. If I stand in one place for a half an hour doing this show, my back hurts. So you're going to see me moving around right now. And why am I doing this? I'm doing it to, to make a point to you, but I'm also doing it because it's stretching out my back. Because the more that my back moves, the better that I feel. If I stood here right now for 30 minutes and, and talked to you, my back would hurt. So I know that if I move around, I'm stretching these tissues and I'm firing off these motion sensitive nerve endings which shut off pain guys immediately by releasing chemicals. So follow me now, follow me. In these same tissues here, the discs and the joints, the disc and the joint, and the muscle spindles, special nerve ending in the muscles, and in the Intertransverse ligament, the supraspinous ligament, the interspinous ligament, you don't need to know that, all that stuff. And in the ligaments, you've got nerve endings that are sensitive to motion. Okay? Which we, we know that that's the case because if you're at home and you're watching this show and I say, close your eyes, move your finger down like this, did you feel it go down? Uh huh. Did you feel it go up? Uh huh. Well, how did you know that you didn't see it? You felt it. That's a mechanical detector which gives you information of where you are. So when you move, it fires these nerve impulses to your brain. Okay? And that's why, luckily, every time I do that test, uh, particularly when the, the cameras are rolling, I touch my nose because we know where that finger is in three-dimensional space. That's a mechanoreceptor, and I'm able to find my nose each time. Okay? So when you stimulate this nerve ending, it runs up that same spinal cord to the back part of the brain here called the cerebellum then to that switchboard again, the switchboard, the thalamus deep inside the brain, and then to the brain itself, the cortex. Okay, so it follows a different pathway, but it ends up in the brain. Now here's where the beauty lies. This is what you need to know. And this is why when people engage in yoga and Pilates and general physical exercise, or they do Dr. Fuller's prescribed spine exercises and so forth, they start feeling better. And this is the main reason if you get a manual adjustment at a chiropractor, all the other techniques, by the way, chiropractors have many techniques, not just that one. If you're 90 and you come into my office, I'm not doing a manual adjustment on you. I'm using light force instruments and all kinds of other things, soft tissue work and so forth. Anyways, we have lots of ways of firing this nerve ending off, which comes to the brain. And then with wonderful circuits, it comes back down the spinal cord to shut down the pain. Do you follow? Great news for acute and chronic pain sufferers. In the brain, it talks to the hypothalamus. And the hypothalamus sends information down the brain stem to a special area here called the periocular ductal gray. If you feel like looking into the science, you don't need to know that. Then into another part of the brain stem called the raphe magnus nucleus. You don't need to know that either. And then it trickles down this, this pathway in the spinal cord called the descending reticular formation. You don't need to know that anyways. The information goes up, and then it comes back down, and then look at this. Here's where the beauty is. When you stimulate this guy here, through this loop, you release chemicals that shut down the pain here and here. We call it pre and post, here and here. It shuts down this pain, and if you do that enough, Vietnam veteran, if you do that enough, Gail and John, if you do this and you fire this pathway enough, you start to degrade and tear up and make these connections, the neuroplastic connections that grew, you tear those up. 
the public works department in the human nervous system says, well, there's less traffic on this pathway. I better tear up those roads. Don't need those roads anymore. Do you follow? So the, the nervous system is only responding to the traffic on it. If there's heavy traffic, they build more roads. If the traffic lighten up, it tears the roads back up again. That's the whole principle. Chronic pain, lots of inflammation, lots of traffic, efficient roads, unfortunately. If you start stimulating the motion-dependent nerve endings and you start to move more, it tears up the roadways because you're shutting off the traffic. Do you follow? Cool. But not only that. So that's dealing with the neurological part of this, the neuroplasticity and the synaptogenesis and the windup. If you have degenerated, unhappy, inflamed discs and facet joints here in your spine, and if those are not dealt with, they're going to continue to send painful information into the spinal cord and the brain. So now you have to deal with these. Well, one of the best ways to deal with that is you go to a, a chiropractor. So if your spine is like this, that's going to cause adverse stresses on your discs and your joints. Follow? If we can maybe main, bring, bring that back to the center line, like realigning the front end of the car, that's going to take more stress off the discs and the joints. Make sense? If we are like this, does this look like it's going to cause some spinal stress? I think so. If we can bring that back in here and take care of that, that's good. So gravitational alignment is something we do in a chiropractic office to take some of the stress off the discs and the joints here. But then we need to increase range of motion. So unfortunately, we're all professional sitters now, right? So we sit so long. So now we have to increase motion and flexibility, right? So we need to do that with all of these stimulation of exercises too. If we improve the health here, we're not going to send as many pain nerve endings in here. The traffic load decreases, the roadways decrease, you start tearing this up. That's why with people with chronic pain, which is kind of, it's kind of a difficult thing, right? When you're in pain, you kind of don't want to move because it might hurt some, but that's exactly what you need to do. So you have to work with somebody that, that is able to navigate that way for you so you're doing the appropriate and right amount of exercise without doing too much to inflame these. You follow? Okay. So that's the mechanical way of, of dealing with these situations on this poster here. Um, dealing with this from a mechanical, and then of course a nerve chemical standpoint as well, tearing up those pathways. But there's more that we need to do. Because I talked about the other ways of making these chronic pain situations better. Once again, you have to have that mindset that I am going to do whatever it takes. My patient John had already said to my patient who referred him in, you need to go see a chiropractor. John said, no, I don't. I've already been to chiropractors and physical therapists and acupuncturists and orthopedists and blah, blah, blah. I've already done anything. And she said, no, 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 you didn't. Give it one more shot and a good thing he did. Okay. So he had the mindset, well, I, I have to get this taken care of. So he made the change. Now, the beauty about this, earlier I talked about medications and why people use them. Just remember that Vioxx and Celebrex went head to head with chiropractic on people with chronic pain. Catch this now. Catch this. This was in the biomedical world's number one journal called Spine, where uh, it was random, ra people were randomly assessed to the chiropractic group and to the drug group and the acupuncture group. It just so happened in this random assessment that the chiropractic group was the worst. They had eight plus years of chronic pain, where the drug group only had six plus years of chronic pain. So we had the worst group, if you will. And the chiropractic group in only nine weeks outperformed the drugs by a factor of five. We were five times more effective in relieving pain. The other beauty of it is one year later these people were studied. Chiropractic was the only group that five of the six outcome measures was still better one year out even without any treatment. So early on there was improvement. A year later still significant improvement. <coughs> now Look at Vioxx for a minute. Can you get Vioxx right now? No. Why? It was taken off the market. Why? Vioxx killed more people in five years, 60,000, than people that died in the Vietnam War in 10 years, 58,000. So Vioxx was taken off the market. And in this study, there were zero side effects from the chiropractic care. Pretty interesting, right? Now, for acute low back pain, chiropractic, again, went head-to-head -head against diclofenac, and we won again. So if we just take medications and we go head-to-head, -head, there we go. What's interesting is, is 
The number one reason that anyone goes under Social Security disability is for back pain. That's the number one reason for somebody to go uh, for Social Security disability. Nine out of ten of them have never been to a chiropractor. But I can show you right here that chiropractic is better than five times more effective than common drugs given to these people with chronic pain. Imagine if we just unleashed chiropractic on all of these people. I think we'd do pretty well. But it even gets better. It even gets better because chiropractic, I just talked about the mechanical pain pathway, right? But chiropractic has now been shown just recently that interleukin-10, one of your anti-inflammatory chemicals in your body, is increased with chiropractic adjustments. That's talking about that systemic effect through the hypothalamus that I talked earlier about. We know that regional, regional cerebral blood flow, we can actually put people in PET scans do one chiropractic adjustment of the spine and we can see blood flow in the brain get better. Blood flow in the brain gets better by working on the special little nerve endings around the spine. That's pretty cool. This is now systemic neurological effects. We've got three good studies that show that chiropractic adjustments, even just one adjustment, reduces high blood pressure in a measurable amount by just working on the spinal nerve endings. So now we're talking about reducing systemic inflammation by chiropractic care working on the spine, okay? Now one of the keys is this. A lot of people in chronic pain are willing to take pain drugs for a long period of time. The comment I have about chiropractic care is you have to give it time. In the case of the Vietnam veteran that I said, it was a year. In the case of John, it was a couple of years before he felt good. In the case of Gail, it was three years of care. That's a lot of care. Not everybody takes that amount of time to get where they need to be. The point is, is People might give chiropractic, if they, if they don't know about chiropractic or how it's going to work, they might give it a week or two or a month and say, you know, I'm not a lot better, forget it kind of thing. I'm just putting that out there for a lot of these cases in chronic pain. The more chronic it is, the best efforts it's going to take to get this better. Well, let's talk about the nutritional um, ramifications of this as well. The fake sugars, glutamate and aspartame. Studies have shed, said, showed that if people go uh, remove all of the glutamate and aspartate or aspartame in their, in their lives, the chronic pain goes away better than drugs can do that. Now, if you're wondering what processed foods actually contain glutamate or glutamic acid, aspartate or uh, uh, aspartamin, go to this website here, truthandlabeling.org, truthandlabeling.org. You can find a list of ingredients that always contain glutamate, or often contain glutamate, or sometimes contain it, you can start to, to narrow this out. Now, Dr. Dan Murphy, again, likes to talk about a patient of his that came into his office, a young woman in her 30s, if I remember correctly. And his, in his intake form, in his history form, which I have put on my history form, we asked people, how many diet sodas do you drink in, in the course of a day? This woman, just in her 30s, said, I drink six per day, and I'm in chronic pain. Dr. Murphy says, you know, Let's try this. Get off the diet soda. Let's see what happens. She's like, okay. Complete resolution of her chronic pain. That one thing. That was it. Will that work for you? Don't know. No promises. But it's something to look at, and the science tells us that as well. Okay. With nutrition, most of us realize we're not eating enough leaves now or green leafy vegetables. So the most powerful vegetables that we can eat that are anti-inflammatory are green leafy vegetables and cruciferous vegetables. Michael Paul and uh, Dr. Hyman have clearly said, along a lot of other researchers, when we increase our omega-6 fats, omega-6 fats are inflammatory fats. Omega-6 fats are things like in corn and soy. Now, the problem with corn and soy in the United States is we, as taxpayers, subsidize corn and soy. That's a problem. So now corn and soy is cheap. What do we do? We put it in everything. But Dr. Fuller, I don't eat corn and I don't eat soy. Well, you probably do because now we're feeding that to animals and now you're eating the animals, the beef and the chicken and so forth, which we're feeding corn and soy to because corn and soy is cheap, grass is more expensive. So we're feeding that, which is now increasing the omega-6 inflammatory fats in these foods, decreasing the omega-3. A hundred years ago, if you eat wild game, wild game actually had omega-3s in it because they were grazing animals and that's where they would get their omega-3s, follow? But now we're feeding a lot of the industrialized, commercialized 
cattle and chickens and, and pork and so forth, and even farmed fish. Farmed fish is now being fed corn and soy. Omega-6 goes up, omega-3s come down. Inflammation goes up, anti-inflammatory effects go down. Now we're all inflamed. And everybody's talking about this ratio being very important. Let's look at that over here in my chart. So the, the next player on here is not only this mechanical and neurological pathway that I talked about, but you can see over here what I've done is I've talked about the big guy right here, inflammation, systemic inflammation. Inflammation is increased by corn and soy. Corn and soy have, an, have a fatty acid called arachidonic acid. If you have too much of this, you increase the inflammatory pathway called prostaglandin E2. Look it up sometime. You'll see why I'm telling you this in just a moment. So when you have more of this in your diet, you're increasing this inflammation, which increases systemic inflammation, which inflames your tissues, which fires off pain nerve endings, which contributes to your chronic pain pathway. So what I'm telling you is, is what you eat could be playing a role in how much pain you have, okay? If we eat more wild fish, not farmed fish, wild fish, we get the nemesis of AA, which is another fatty acid called eicosapentaenoic acid. Now, uh, if you're a vegan and you're not going to have wild fish or take fish oil, then you go get algae oil. Because what is, where's the root of all this? It starts as algae. Small fish eat algae. They have an enzyme that converts the DHA in algae to EPA, so now you have the fish that have both EPA and DHA, okay? But you can get it from algae. Uh, it's not as good, but there you go. So wild fish has this, and then if you do that, you crank up the anti-inflammatory pathway, which shuts off inflammation here, called prostaglandin E3. What you then eat, if you're eating leaves and cruciferous vegetables and, and so forth, and if you're eating less animal protein, but it's grass-fed. Why, why, why is that so important? Now you know. Now you know. If it's grass-fed um, uh, animals and they're cage-free and there's no antibiotics and so forth, if they're not fed corn and soy, now you're going to crank up your anti-inflammatory pathway. You're going to decrease the chances of having pain. So taking supplements can do this as well. People will ask me, well, can you do this by diet alone? Probably. You, pr you probably could. You probably can. You probably can. But now, food has so, been so messed up. Uh, the way that we farm now, in, in, in general, with the huge commercialized farms, growing the same crop, monocrops, mono growing the same crop on the same uh, strip of land year after year, and then making it GMO, and then making it more omega-6, and then doing nasty things to the seeds, so now it's um, glyphosate ready, uh, uh, Roundup ready, and all of this kind of thing. And then you have large companies that want to control everything by controlling seeds and so forth, Monsanto. So then you're getting this really nasty way of, of, of farming instead of how it was done for thousands and thousands of years, where you have different crops being grown on land, and then you have animals that are uh, creating fertilizer, and then you move the crops over here on, on another year, and so on and so forth. So you're actually giving the soil a chance to recover and keeping those nutrients high. We're not doing that on a grand scale any longer. So then you have messed up crops, and then you've got this situation happening here, which is going to lead to a more inflammatory pathway. So literally, we're inflaming ourselves with our food. You follow? So one way to do that is to increase your fish oil intake, which has omega-3s. Just keep in mind now, follow me now, follow me. Never take fish oil without taking supplemental antioxidants. Omega-3 fats are easy to oxidize. You have to protect them with anti-inflammatory things like B vitamins, C, E, magnesium, selenium, CoQ10, alpha-lipoic acid. You don't have to know all of that. Go to my website and you'll see a product called Complete Omega-3 Cofactors, and I list on there what research has said over time, thank you, Dr. Murphy, it says over time what you should be taking to protect your omega-3s from oxidation, because if you don't, you get lipid peroxides, and that's really bad. So you protect that, but you also, the more antioxidants you take, the more you clear, clear out some of this inflammation in your body, too. Follow? So literally now, you're talking about supplements and dietary choices and getting rid of the glutamate, monosodium glutamate, glutamate that's hidden, toothandlabeling.org. You're getting rid of 
aspartame and aspartate and aspartic acid. You're getting rid of those fake sugars and sweeteners and food enhancers. You're getting rid of the corn and soy, and then you're increasing this anti-inflammatory pathway, you see? So literally, supplements can fight chronic pain. What you eat can fight chronic pain. Chiropractic and movement therapy can fight chronic pain. Can you see all these tools now that we have that are building us up? Okay, so those are important to this as well. One way of t looking at foods that have more omega-3s is a great book called The, um the Ultimate Omega-3 Diet. The Ultimate Omega-3 Diet. In there has a great chart that talks about how much omega-3s are in your foods. So you can actually look at that, that book. It's a really interesting book. I want to take a side note here. As I'm saying all of this information to you, it may be someday that 250 million Americans say, hey, Dr. Fuller, we want you to be president. And I'd think about that, and I thought, if you really want me to, uh, I, you know, I, I, I probably don't want that job. Um, but let's say, let's say a lot of you want, want that to happen, just, just for fun. We'll just say that for fun. So all of a sudden, I'm swept up, and everybody says, we want you to be president because you've got to change this. You've got to change health care. You've got to change all of this deal that's going on. Okay. I will never be president because I will never get through the Iowa caucus because I will remove the farm subsidies for corn and soy. If I say, say that in Iowa, I'm out. I will never get past the Iowa caucuses. You see, that's a problem. Well, let's say that I tell the Iowa farmers and all the other farmers out there, and, and uh, uh, kudos to you for feeding us food, right? I say, okay, I know you're trapped in the monocrops and Monsanto and seeds and GMO and production, and we're giving you all this money to grow cheap crops, and even if the crops don't work, we still pay you, and so on and so forth. Let's say I just change that. I'm able to somehow change that as a president. And I say, okay, all of you farmers, we're just going to switch you from uh, monocrops with chemicals to organic crops uh, with lots of fruits and vegetables and so forth. And you're going to be in business. You're going to make as much money and so on. We're going to take care of you. And then all the farmers say, cool. And so I get through the Iowa caucuses. Now I'm in the uh, general election, and you all vote for me, and now I'm president. At the end of the day, then all of a sudden I have a freak accident. So I'd probably be in an office for about a day before I'm eliminated because then we would take, I would take large companies like Monsanto and say, you're out. And they would say, no, you're out. Okay, so that would be a problem. You can see that the, the, the system is so entrenched with, with money that it would be so difficult to tear that down. I don't know how you would do that from the top down. So that's kind of the bad news. The good news is we as individuals can start taking steps in here, like I'm mentioning on the show right now, that you can save yourself and save your family and save your community and get involved with the school system and have community gardens and school gardens and demand that we go down to the lunchroom and say, we're not going to buy the, the subsidized foods any longer. We're going to locally source our foods like uh, UMass does, which has the best nutrition program of any college in the country. So you start doing things like that, and you know that it actually can be done. And there's other school systems around the country that are doing this, like saying, we're not going to feed our kids this inferior food to give them inferior brains and an inferior life and a chance of having chronic pain. We're going to make that change. We're going to make that change by saying, <clears throat> we're going to look at the omega-6, omega-3 fat ratio. We're going to say, 117 years ago, at the turn of last century, the average American was one to one bad fat, if you will. You need omega-6, but I'm just going to call it bad fat bad fat to good fat. The ratio used to be one to one. Dr. Hyman, myself, Dr. Murphy, and all the other researchers, Dr. Maroon, say that the ultimate ratio should be anywhere from one to one to four to one, no more than that. If you're 15 to one bad fat to good fat, 15 to one, you're at the risk of a chronic disease. The average American now is 25 to one. 25 to 1, bad fat to good fat, for all of the reasons that I just told you. That's really bad. That's why anybody in my office that wants to get a little finger prick, I test their ratio and I send it out and get that number, find out what it is, and then we to go on, on steps to undo that, to decrease their inflammation. The worst ratio we've seen, I believe, it's over 70. It was 75 to 1. It was actually one of Dr. Murphy's patients, somebody that was having a lot of chronic problems. And when this ratio up, you're not only at the risk of chronic pain, but you're at the risk of other inflammatory-related diseases, heart disease, cancer, 
Alzheimer's, diabetes, and so forth. So this is linked into everything that's going on in your body. You want to drop that level. Even if you don't know what your ratio is, you should take steps to increase your omega-3s and decrease your omega-6s, mainly by diet. You're not going to out-supplement your mouth. So keep that in mind. Supplements are not going to save you. Supplements are exactly that. They're a supplement to the program that we're talking about in here. Now, Dr. Maroon, who was the um, neurosurgeon for the Pittsburgh Steelers, I don't know if he still is or not, but he did a thing. He put, he put chronic pain people on high omega-3s, and the omega-3s beat pain drugs 88% of the time, 88%. Just one little supplement and one little study said this is how powerful that can be. Other supplements that can help fight pain include malic acid and magnesium. Those are some supplements that I recommend to people as well. So let me catch you up to speed now. You know that chiropractic, for all of the reasons that I talked about, is, something, is a very good tool in dealing with and trying to decrease chronic pain. We know that balancing your omega-6, omega-3 fat ratio and getting that in the, in the best deal that it can is very, very important. And this is a handout I'm going to have on my website, so you can follow along later on. The billions Americans spend on pain drugs is primarily to counter the effects of too much omega-6 and too little omega-3 in the diet because you're increasing your inflammation, and then we take pain drugs for that. Uh, improving that, um, that ratio is a good idea. And by the way, a couple of other supplements that you can take are called resveratrol and curcumin. A lot of you have asked me about this in my office. Resveratrol is the anti-inflammatory uh, substance in grapes. So that's why people say drink wine. Well, it's not the wine, it's, it's the red grapes. It's red grapes. Sorry about that, it's red grapes. Curcumin is the active ingredient in turmeric. So be generous with your turmeric and your cooking, and there you go. Now, vitamin D is something else that's also very important. Vitamin D, the sunshine vitamin, right? Uh, vitamin D is very important, and it's the cheapest supplement out there. Vitamin D is probably a penny per day per person. And I've been checking and following people's vitamin D levels in my office for, say, seven years now. Not one person, including myself, has had adequate vitamin D without supplementation. Your goal level should be at least 50 to 70. I won't even give you the units. If it's 50 to 70, it's a whole number. You're going to be anywhere from 0 to 100. You're probably going to be closer to 0. <laughs> uh, 100 might be too much. If you have chronic pain, you should be pretty close to that, say, some, some scientists and researchers. So you want to get that, that tested. As many as 60% of people with chronic pain have levels below 50 to 70. I would agree with that. Uh, remember to reduce, uh, eliminate dietary excitotoxins. Dr. Russell Blaylock wrote, wrote, wrote that book called Excitotoxins, the, the Taste That Kills. Great book. And that was about the glutamate and aspartate in foods, knocking those out, right? Malic acid, as we talked about, and magnesium. Magnesium is something, uh, with what I do with most of my patients, and you should only do this under advice of your doctor, by the way. And, oh, I just want to mention this, too. Everything that I'm talking right now is not medical advice. I just talked about drugs, but I'm a chiropractor. I have no license, licensure to give you medication advice. I'm just quoting research to you. Whatever you decide to do is between you and your doctor regarding medications. Your medications are your own decisions. I'm not giving you any, any medical advice whatsoever. I'm just quoting research, and then you can do with the information as you wish. Okay? So also with these supplements, you need to talk to somebody that is knowledgeable about your supplements, particularly if you're taking medications. You want to make sure that there's no interactions between supplements that I'm talking about and medications that you might be taking. Now magnesium, what I'm finding with a lot of people, and I do this for myself, is 600 milligrams per day is usually pretty good. 300 milligrams in the morning, 300 milligrams at night. You might want to titrate that up slowly just to see if your body reacts okay to that. Maybe you start with 300 milligrams and go from there. And just as a side note, people ask me about restless leg all the time. With restless legs, I find that uh, number one is easy to do. Most people are dehydrated, so you just need some water, and that usually will take care of it. But secondly, it's magnesium. I find that if you get some magnesium going, it usually takes care of people with restless legs. Very, very easy thing to do, and, and it works out pretty well. <clears throat> Next is managing insulin resistance. Insulin, insulin, insulin is responding to sugar. If we don't have our sugar regulation appropriate, <clears throat> if our sugar is too high, our blood sugar that is, our blood glucose, that's going to be a problem. The more insulin response, the more systemic inflammation you have. How many people 
have blood sugar dysregulation. Lots of people. So if we can start getting that down, that's going to go, that's going to move us in a huge way of dealing with our chronic pain problem. Now that's going to take cleaning up our diet to the, as best you can, and that's going to be regular exercise. We need di regular daily exercise to your tolerance. Once again, talk to your doctor, find out what's appropriate for you. Don't be changing medications until you talk to your doctor. If you have blood sugar dysregulation and you're on blood sugar medications, um, maybe it's uh, insulin regulation uh, drugs and so on and so forth. Before you start doing significant dietary changes and, uh, and changing medications, talk to your doctor and say, hey, this is what I want to do. I want to clean up my diet. I want to get some regular physical exercise. I want to take some supplements. What do you think? You're going to have to have your doctor watching you carefully through this so you're not doing too much too soon and then your blood sugar crashes appropriately, but then your, your medications are out of whack and so forth. So be careful. Work with your doctor on this. Uh, let's see, if your insulin is high, it accelerates the conversion of linoleic acid to arachidonic acid. So, back to our chart. If your insulin is high, you're going to take a one fatty acid called linoleic acid, and it's going to increase its conversion to arachidonic acid which piles you, piles you down the inflammatory pathway. You, 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 did you follow that? So if your blood sugar is dysregulated, if you get too much blood sugar swings, too much insulin release, even if you're not an insulin dependent diabetic, I'm not even talking about that, I'm just talking about blood sugar dysregulation. You're going to crank up your conversion of one fatty acid to this inflammatory fatty acid, you crank up your inflammation, and you hurt more even though you didn't get an injury. You follow that? So that's a big problem in this inflammatory pathway. So you need to get your insulin uh, get up. And, and on here I wrote down just the cleanest diet that you can enjoy. High in vegetables and low in processed foods. Con consider going gluten free and dairy free. Okay. Now remember I also have a low level uh, laser in my office and we talked about that. By the way, spine exercises. I've talked about spine exercises a couple million times on this show as well. So the more you exercise and move, you're firing off those special nerve veins which fight pain and then you're taking care of your discs and your joints here better. You're keeping them uh, happier and when you have a happy back you have less chance of having uh, back pain. So the mindset, the, the, as in summary, um, this is what you should be doing if you have chronic pain and you have very, very effective tools as opposed to just uh, taking those pain medications. You have to have the mindset. You have to have that willingness to say, I'm going to step up and I'm going to do the things that are important. I'm definitely going to do this to the best of my ability and I'm going to surround myself with people that are going to help me. Let's try that chiropractic thing. It might just work for me. How about that low-level laser therapy, a cold laser? I have one. Remember, if you want to do some research on that, the, the, um, the one that I have is from a company called Urconia. Urconia had the first laser that was FDA approved and their first approval was for plantar fasciitis. So literally it's just light photons sh shine on the foot that improve plantar fasciitis. Pretty cool. And all a laser is doing just is it's adding light photons to this whole pathway that I mentioned earlier. Pretty cool thing. No side effects except for don't shine it in the eye. Pretty good. Improving your nutrition to as clean as you possibly can, getting away from corn and soy, that is, getting away from corn and soy fed animals, increasing those supplements that we talked about, the omega-3s and malic acid and resveratrol and curcumin and B-complex and CoQ10, alpha-lipoic acid, and acetylcysteine and so on and so on. Making sure that you're drinking enough water, go to my YouTube page, I have a video on there, Water Rules, we did the show on that. Regular physical exercise, spine related exercise every single day to your tolerance, managing the sitting position because we're all professional sitters, getting enough and adequate sleep will go a long way to helping ourselves with people with chronic pain which is one out of two people in the United States. So if we work together we can really make a difference in chronic pain. I'm Dr. Scott Fuller, please join me again.